All right, guys. Well, today we want to talk a little bit about Paul. Anybody like Paul? Uh, indeed. Uh, anybody like Paul? Man. Yes. Paul. Show sure love. Paul. Come on. <laughs> Nobody likes Paul? Come on now. Oh. Nobody likes Paul, right? Amen. Come Woo. on. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, well, yeah, the reason I want to talk a little bit about Paul today is, uh, you know, we're always hearing uh, Paul said, right? Mm -hmm. Let's look at what Paul said. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we have uh, some groups today, and, and I know you guys are probably familiar with this, or some of you are. We have some group today that even try to deny Paul. Uh, for various different reasons that are made up essentially because they say that he taught something against what the Lord taught I don't think so so let's just uh, we're going to start off in Romans we're going to be in Romans a lot we're going to probably probably get around to looking at a few other scriptures um, you know we never know for sure how it's going to go as we start we'll go as the spirit leads us but we're going to start off in Romans chapter 7 and we're going to Concentrate on Romans 7, starting in verse 14, and Romans chapter 8, and a little bit of chapter 9, probably today. Okay. So, Romans chapter 7, verse 14. Now, this is a very important statement Paul makes right at the beginning of this uh, verse, but most people miss it all the time. Uh, what does Paul say starting off here? For we know that the law is spiritual. Mm -hmm. The law is spiritual. Okay? So what is Paul telling us? He's telling us the same thing that the Most High told us through the prophets, is he not? Because he said that he would do what to us? He would give us a new heart. Amen. And that heart, and he'd put a new spirit within us. Amen. And that new heart would allow us and enable us to be able to keep his law. Amen. So, so that's this really what Paul's confirming with his first statement here, that the law itself is spiritual. Amen. That doesn't do away with the law, the law being spiritual, does it? No. Yeah. He says, but I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. What Paul's saying there, that he himself is what? A slave to sin. Amen. That he himself essentially can do nothing. But let's go on and see what he says. Verse 15, he says, I do not understand my own actions. Mm -hmm. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Mm -hmm. He says, now, if I do what I do not want, I agree the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but the sin that dwells within me. Mm -hmm. For I know that nothing good dwells within me. That is my flesh. So Paul's saying of himself, nothing good dwells within him. He said, I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil that I do not want is what I do. Amen. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but the sin that dwells within me. Paul makes that statement twice. He says, He's telling you, if he follows the flesh, it's the sin that dwells within him. He says it twice, so he's trying to get this across to you. And, and then he goes on and says, So I find it to be a law that when I do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my innermost self. But I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members, wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? So Paul says he's a wretched man and that his flesh dwells on sin and that nothing good is naturally within him is what he's told you in all of this. And then he asked a very important question, right? Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? The very next verse, he's going to answer us. I mean, think about it. The answer is here. This is a problem most people don't read enough to, to get the answer. Right, right. He says, thanks be to God through Yeshua Messiah, our Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Paul gives you the answer to who's going to rescue him. 
And he goes on and says, So then, with my mind, I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh, I am a slave to the law of sin. Mm -hmm. So he says, what? With his mind, he knows, he's a slave to the law of God, but with his flesh, he's a slave to the sin. So if he gives in to the flesh, he's a slave to the law of sin and death. Yeah. Now, if people would read, and we're going to go on into chapter 8 here, but if people would read what Paul has to say here in the latter part of chapter 7 of Romans and then chapter 8 and a little bit into chapter 9, they've really separated one thing that he's talking about with some chapters. But if they would read this, they would have a much better understanding of what Paul's talking about in the book of Galatians. When Paul talks about a law that is bondage, what is he talking about? Because Paul is all about there's freedom in Messiah. There's freedom in Christ. Amen. The law that is bondage is that law that is what? Sin and death. So if people would just read like the word says, how's the word does read? Line upon line, precept upon precept. Read everything the man has to say. And that's why today, obviously, we can't cover everything Paul had to say today, right? But we try to cover it over time, do we not? Amen. And today we're going to be looking, like I say, predominantly here what he's saying to us in the book of Romans here. He says, listen to this, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Messiah Yeshua. He just told you that he's your deliverer, right? He's the one that's going to redeem him, deliver him. Yeah. And he says, so now there's no condemnation for those that are in Messiah Yeshua. For the law of the Spirit of life in Yeshua Messiah has set you free from the law of sin and death. Amen. So when he... So the very next verse explains what it means when there's no condemnation for those who are in the side of Yeshua. I've read that. I've heard people read that one all by itself and say, see, that means if you profess Christ, it don't matter what you do. That's not what Paul said, was it? The very next verse, he explains what he's saying in that verse. He says, for the law of the spirit of the life of Yeshua, Yeshua, Yeshua Messiah, has set you free from the law of sin and death. So it has set you free from the fact that, what? Is anybody, is, is anybody in here ever lived a completely sinless life? No. I'm glad there are no liars among us today. I didn't see your hands shoot up there. So, according to the law, if you ever sinned, you had to what? Die. 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 That's the law of sin and death. This is that law that Paul talks a lot about being bondage. This is the law that Christ has set you free from. This is not Christ's own law, moral law, the way to live your life that he tells you about, which he defines as sin if you cross it. It's the fact that the law stated once you sinned, you had to die. And like we talk a lot about, and I'll mention again today as we're going along here in Romans, what, and I saw my brother post about it this week, what was the first lie ever told to humankind by Satan? Surely you won't die. You shall surely not die. All right, all right. Satan's still telling that same lie. 6,000 years later, he's still using the same lie. Amen. Do what you want. It don't matter what God said, you won't die. Mm -hmm. He's using the exact same lie. And guess what? It worked. People are just as gullible now as Eve was back in the Garden of Eden. Many scores and scores of people are still believing. Amen. It doesn't matter what God said. Do what you want. You won't die. Because I mean, he's really not the kind of guy that's going to kill you, right? Mm -hmm. he's, a he's a loving God. He won't kill you. Satan tries to make God out to be the liar when Satan himself is the one that's a liar, right? Amen. Amen. He tries to convince you, it's okay. Do as you want. <laughs> he told that lie way back in the Garden of Eden. Okay, right. when Eve went for that lie, how did it work out? Mm, not too good. She was cast out of paradise. Right? And Messiah, and this is what Paul's explaining to us, Messiah came that we might what? Be reconciled back unto him. Amen. For we might have a chance to enter into paradise. The same paradise that our ancestors got kicked out of. Mm -hmm. That's what he means by reconciling him, uh, us back unto himself. Removing the curse of the law, which is Sin and die. Sin and die. Now, he says in verse 3, 
For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Now, before we read verse 4, because it's going to give us some responsibility, it's still talking about what Messiah did, right? It says, He condemned sin in what? In the flesh. How did He condemn sin in the flesh? He never sinned. He walked in the flesh. He came and He lived the whole life. And He never once sinned. And what did that do? He proved Satan a liar in that because one of the accusations that Satan has made is it can not be done. Right. Satan has said, you gave a law that no one can follow. It's impossible. You're unfair. You're unjust. It's a burden. You've, yeah, you've given this burden that no one can bear. Can you imagine Satan's reaction whenever he himself said, I'm going to step down in the flesh and prove you a liar. Amen. Come on. Because I suspect Satan thought there'd be somebody. But can you imagine his reaction when he himself said, I'm going to step in the flesh and prove you a liar. Amen. I suspect Satan was a little worried that day. And guess what? We be. know as the scripture tells us, he could have failed. He could have sinned. Says he was tempted in like manner, exactly the same as we all are. Tells us so in the, in the, in the book of Hebrews. Amen. That's why. What did Satan do whenever he was here on earth? Satan led him out into the wilderness, did he not? He tempted him, tempted him and, he, and what did he offer him? Everything okay. of this world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He offered him everything of this world. He said, "I give you everything of this world if you'll just bow down and worship me." Quoted scripture to him. Mm-hmm. What did Messiah do? He quoted scripture right back. He quoted it in context instead of out of context, right? right? Amen. And that's always important for us to do. Quote it in context and not out of context. Now, verse 4, he says, right after he says, he condemns sin in the flesh, he says, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Amen. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So now Paul is breaking it down a little bit now, right? Paul's saying, so if you got the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, then you can fulfill the law in your life. Yeah. Mm. You can fulfill the law in your life. Now, fulfilling the law means what? <clears throat> it means obeying it. It means carrying it out, showing its full purpose. Right. Because... Remember back in Matthew, that's where people always try to say that Messiah did away with the law when he says he fulfilled it. That's not what he's saying at all. Right. It means he expounded upon it. He shows the full meaning of it. We that are baptized in his Holy Spirit are supposed to be doing that in our own lives. Amen. But we walk this life on this earth now, but that is what the Scripture is. The same thing John's trying to tell us when John, John says, if you know him, you must walk exactly as he walked. Amen. He fulfilled the law with his life and how he walked it. Now we have his spirit dwelling within us. We have a responsibility to do the same. Why? Because he says, be ye holy because I am holy. Amen. And he says, be ye perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Isaiah 9 and 6, when speaking to the Son, says he shall be called everlasting Father. Amen. So he's saying, I came to do it. I showed you it can be done now. As Paul just said, you're weak in the flesh. You can't do it by yourself. But if you accept the indwelling of his spirit, mm-hmm. now you can do it. Amen. And as you walk fulfilling this law, walk like he walked, what does it do for others around you? Shine the light. It helps them. It strengthens them, right? Mm-hmm. Because you may have someone in your life or someone you just cross paths with that's lost, stumbling around in darkness, not knowing what to do, knowing something's missing. And simply by the way you're walking your life, they may say, I want something that she's got. Amen. I want something he's got. I see something in this person that might just be what's missing in me because, you know, they got the same problems I've got, but they don't seem to be so tore up about them. 
Because I guarantee you all of us can remember when we lived a life of sin, the least little thing got you all unhinged, didn't it? Yeah. Got you tore up. Everything was the end of everything, right? Everything that happened, all this sin, I ain't ever going to recover from this. Right? And people remember feeling like that. I know you do. But once you have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, there's nothing in this world that's the end of everything. Amen. And you realize that. So it's kind of like the old saying, it's, then it's more a little bit more like water off a duck's back, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I know some people probably don't understand that saying because I assume that everybody grew up around farm animals, but everybody didn't, right? Nope. Okay. <laughs> well, let me explain that saying real quick because I use it sometimes. A duck has a certain oil that his body produces. It gets on his feathers. He never gets wet. My ducks can walk around in the rain all day and they love it. And they're just as dry as they were when the rain started. They never get wet. Well, that's the, hence the saying water off a duck's back. It doesn't have any effect on you. Okay? So the things of this world will not have any effect on you. They'll roll right off of you because you know that they are not what really matters. Amen. Now, he goes on to say in verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Amen. Now, remember the very first statement he made? We know that the law is what? Spiritual. So the law is one of the things of the Spirit, is it not? Amen. He says, To set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God and does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Amen. So you have all of these people telling you today, the law is bondage. You shouldn't have anything to do with the old law keepers, right? You hear it preached all the time. What Paul is saying? Paul said it's the fleshly mind that cannot submit to God's law. And he says those in the flesh cannot please God. Amen. Who wants to please God today? Amen. I do. I want to be known as his faithful servant. Yes, Lord. And the way I can be known as his faithful servant is, in, is accept the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Because like Paul explained right at the beginning of this, you can't do it by yourself. That's right. If you're relying on self, how far are you going to get? People that are relying on self, that are that is the blind leading the blind. Amen. That's the ones that they both gonna run off in the ditch because this guy here studied up so much and I'm so smart. Hmm. Now I'm gonna go teach everybody else what I know. And guess what? You're both heading right for a ravine because you're relying on self and what you know. Now, I'm not saying don't study. He says study to show thyself approved. But first and foremost, you better get a good dose of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Holy Spirit must be dwelling within you or you ain't going to understand any of it. That's right. You're going to think you're going to understand something, but it's going to be by the vain philosophy of man. Yeah. Right. Because there's no other way. And Paul made that very clear. That there, that's why I wanted to get that part in, in chapter 7 because Paul himself, the Apostle Paul, picked, hand-picked by the Most High, shone the light down around him on the road to Damascus. He said, I choose you, Paul, to preach my gospel. To a whole bunch of people. I got a lot of people to send you to. Handpicked by him. What Paul say? If I rely on me, I can't do anything but sin. Amen. He said, if I start relying on myself and my thoughts and my flesh, I can do evil. That's what I can do. That's what he told us. Amen. He said, but if I rely on the Spirit, he said, who will be some rich man of mine? Who will rescue me? And then he gave you the answer. Messiah and Yeshua. Jesus Amen. the Christ will rescue me and he'll Amen. rescue each one of us if we let him. That's right. That's right. We have to be obedient and let him. Amen. We can kick against the bricks. We can fight against it. And he's not going to force you, right? That's, right? that's right. He'll let you run off in your way and do it your way. That's right. But it's not going to work out well. You know, the people celebrate in this world, thing in this world, people celebrate what? Doing it their way, right? There was a real famous guy. One of the last songs he recorded was, I did it my way, right? Mm -hmm. Well, everybody's really celebrated that song, didn't they? 
course, he ripped it off from another famous guy. But that's a whole other story. But the world celebrates doing it your way. Amen. I don't want to do it my way. I don't. Whenever, whenever I leave this world, I don't want y'all to say he did it his way. Amen. Because if, if that's the way I'm remembered by, I'm in trouble. Amen. Right. Come on. I'm in trouble. I I want y'all to remember me as he did it his way. Right. He did it right. his way. He relied on him to lead him in his life Amen. because I don't know where I'm going. That's right. I don't I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing if I don't rely on him. That's right. That's right. Other than the fact I know I'm heading into a ditch somewhere. Amen. I'm going I'm gonna mess up if I rely on myself. Anytime I take the wheel, I'm in trouble. That's a fact. Amen. We have to let him lead in our lives. And this is what Paul is telling us. And remember. We're going to read some more statements from Paul about this law in a minute, about God's law. He's already explained to us, though, as we're going along here, that he's talking about two completely different laws. One of them he's calling what? Death, evil, bad, you know, bondage, all of those things. And the other one he's saying is life and peace. Amen. And he's saying if you are in a fleshly mind, you can't follow that one that's life and peace. Amen. A fleshly mind can't do it. He says hostile to it. It's hostile to it. Now, he goes on and says, and this is who we want to be. We want to be these he's speaking to right here. He says, but you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit. Amen. Says the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Messiah does not belong to Him. Amen. Amen. So think about that. He's already told you, if you've got that Spirit, then you'll be following that law because that law is spiritual. Amen. If you don't, you can't follow that law. And now he spread out tells you that if you don't have his spirit, you don't belong to him. That's scary, isn't it? Amen. Because so many people have bought into this. All I have to do is believe in him. Mm -hmm. Now, believing in him is a start, right? That's right. We talked about that earlier there before service started. Some people profess they don't believe in him. That's scary. So believing in him is a start. Mm -hmm. But the scripture explicitly states that even the demons believe. Amen. Okay? Mm -hmm. So believing in him is not your finishing point. That's right. That's a starting point. Amen. Believing in him, having a heart that wants to serve him, and then following the steps that he tells you to follow in his word, Amen. walking in obedience to his word. All these things that are written within his laws. Amen. These are the things that you must grow in, walk in. Amen. You're not going to get them all down pat the first day, right? That's right. First day you came to believe, the first day you came to repent and turn to Him, did you know everything to do? No. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But you knew one thing. You had a desire to please Him. That's right. Amen. Amen. You had a desire to please Him. If He's truly put his spirit within you you have a desire to please him yeah. and he yeah. says you must have a humble heart in order for this to occur That's right. you got to get rid of the old pride mm -hmm. you got to get rid of self you got to quit thinking you're so smart mm -hmm. you know I've told you all this before and, and and you know I've had my wife testify about it too many times I used to think I was the smartest man in the world right <laughs> and then I figured out I was real dumb mm -hmm. okay I started making progress when I figured out I was real dumb that's just a fact because as a group, I'm just going to tell you the truth, guys. Get offended if you want to. There's not a smart person in this room. Amen. As a group, and I mean humanity, we are some dumb creatures. Amen. Okay? Amen. Without our Creator, we will show how stupid we are. Amen. We'll act stupid. We'll do stupid things. Amen. In fact, we'll do evil things like Paul talked about there. Now, he goes on in 10 and says, But if Messiah is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. If the spirit of him who raised Yeshua from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Messiah from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies and also through his spirit that dwells in you. Amen. You realize already we're... We're not halfway through chapter 8. We started in, in uh, chapter 7, verse 14. We read less than a chapter. 
told them. You realize how many times Paul, I haven't counted them, so don't get to them, don't ask me, Pastor, how many? Uh, you realize how many times he's already told you you must have the Spirit dwelling within you? He said it over and over, almost every other line, Paul says, you got to have the Spirit dwelling within you. Amen. He's telling you, you got to have the baptism of the Spirit. If you do not, you will not get it. That's right. You will not understand it. Right. You will not be able to submit to it. You will fight against it. You will not have life in peace. He's telling you these things over and over. He said it repeatedly, repeatedly. That's one reason I wanted to start off with this bit of scripture from Paul this morning or this afternoon because he tells us so much here about we have to have the Spirit dwelling within us. <clears throat> so he goes on in verse 12 and says, So then, brothers and sisters, we are not debtors to sin to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, and you will live. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. It goes, he's talking about exactly what Messiah tells us in John chapter 8. He says, those who are mine have already passed from death unto life. Amen. They've been baptized by my Spirit, and they've already passed from death unto life. So they're no longer worried about this physical death, this physical things of this world, the worldly things here, because... They know they're no longer a part of this world. They're just passing through it. Amen. Right. Hallelujah. Amen. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Hallelujah. Amen. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption as children Amen. when we cry, Abba, Father. It is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirits that we are children of God. And if children and heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Messiah, if in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if you suffer a little bit, is it ever going to be compared to the suffering he did for us? No. You know, it doesn't come close, does it? We get picked on a little bit, right? Because we're those strange people that believe in keeping the law of God. Right? Is that anything compared to how he suffered for us? He was that strange guy that believed in keeping the law too, you know. Amen. And he really suffered for it. His own people who claimed to keep the law did what? Died. They, they said, crucify him, crucify him. Now, many of his own people were also followers. Let's not forget that. There were thousands, all of his disciples were his own people also, right? They were truly his own people. These other pre were pretenders right. that said they were his own people, right? right. And, and we still have the, the same classifications today, do we not? We have those that are truly his, his children, like he's talking about, and we have those pretenders that say they are. Amen. Because I'd say, I, I don't know, uh, somebody may know statistics on this, but a large percentage of this nation would profess to be Christian, would they not? Yeah. Amen. To say you're Christian is to profess to be his, right? That's right. Now, if the large percentage of this nation, and I'm going to say it's probably 70% or more, I don't know for sure, but if that much of this nation were truly followers of Christ, would we have the things in this nation that we do? No. If a nation was just 70% followers of Christ, would you have abortion in it? No. 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 Because that 70% wouldn't allow it. That's right. You wouldn't have all of these things that are against him and against his law because it would not be allowed. So we still have the same thing today. We have many that profess him, but they don't know him. And uh, for more on that, we could go to 1 John, but that's not where we're going to go today because John talks a lot about that professing to know him but not knowing him, right? Amen. So he goes on in verse 18 and says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when we think about the days that we're living in now, coronavirus, uh, wars, rumors of wars, murders, and you know, I, I, I looked at the news last night and like on my computer, and I kid you not, like three art, three of the probably three out of the first ten articles that popped up was about parents killing their own kids. I'm talking about little kids. You know. 
Man, that makes you suffer, does it not? It breaks my heart when I read it. But he says the suffering of this time is nothing compared to the glory to come. Amen. Okay. And now one thing I always take some comfort in when I read about those children, he'll take care of those children. That's right. That's right. And if they don't do some serious and quick repenting, he'll also take care of those that harm those children. Amen. Exactly. Amen. Now, it is his desire that all come to repentance. So we shouldn't pray that these people immediately be destroyed without a chance to repent, right? Amen. As hard as that is for us. Because what's your first thought when you hear about someone harming a child? Kill them. Get them. Get them. Exactly. Take care of them. But we need to remember they need repentance also. Amen. So, he goes on in 19, he says, For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility not of its own, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of glory of the children of God. Now, what caused the bondage and decay of his creation? Sin. Sin. Exactly. Go right back to sin. Because there was no bondage, there was no decay of any of his creation until what? Goes back to what we were talking about a while ago. Until humanity believed the adversaries lie, you shall not die. Amen. That is when bondage started. That's when decay of creation started. Up until that time, listen, even up until the time of the flood, they, they found artifacts from before the flood, and it shows you what? That the earth was in a continual state of growing. There wasn't this, the trees didn't have grow rings on them. They grew continually. The earth was not meant to die. It wasn't created to die. Sin caused it. Amen. Sin caused decay. Sin caused bondage. But he's, Paul is promising us of a day that what? All of this will be made right. Amen. Amen. He says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and, all, and not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies, for in hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen that is seen is not hope for who hopes for what is seen. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it in patience. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's talking about the same thing that is told us this hope he's talking about here is the exact same way faith is described in Hebrews. What, how is faith described in Hebrews? It's, it is not seen. It's relying on things not seen. Amen. So we talk about the fact, and you can see the evidence of him in his creation, right? Mm -hmm. But do you see him? No. If, if, if we looked upon him in our state today, what would happen to us? Die. We would die. Scripture says so. Amen. So this is what Paul's talking about. We know he exists even though we don't see him right now. We can see him in his creation. We can see him in ourselves. We can see him in one another. Whenever, you know, my brother-in-law who, uh, who's passed away in this last year or so, he used to always, me and him would have biblical talks. He would always, this, this is why he was willing to listen to me what I had to say about the Bible. Because he'd say, I knew you before. And no man changes himself like that. Amen. He said, the spirit, you got the spirit, or you could not have changed the way you've changed. Amen. So we see him in each other. Right. We see him around us, but we don't see him directly. Amen. But we have faith in him, right? Yes. We have our hope in him. He is in our hope. Right. You know, he is our hope. He's our hope. He's right. the existence of our hope. Amen. Right? I mean, this is what the apostle Paul preached over and over. What? Through his resurrection, there we have hope. That's right. Because if he is resurrected, so will we be. Amen. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Scripture says in like manner. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The grave had no power over him. And if you've got his spirit within you and you're one of his children, the grave has no power over you. Amen. Remember that. So to pass from this life means what? <laughs> Not much, right? You know, sure, those of us who are left behind if you pass before us we'll miss you right, right. 
Right. I miss my brother-in-law when he's talking about it. Yeah. But you know, it's okay. This life's always just been temporary, right? That's right. This is temporary and everything in this is temporary. So, <clears throat> he says in verse 26, likewise, and remember this, when we're suffering, we're grieving and all those things, likewise the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Mm -hmm. So when we're weak, who helps us? Spirit. Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not even know how to pray as we ought. Amen. But that very spirit intercedes, intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God who searches the heart knows what is in the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So the spirit literally intercedes for us. And we're going to read something else in a minute. It's going to show you who that spirit is. But we'll get there in just a minute. The spirit intercedes for us in our weakness when we don't even know how to pray. Think about that. I guarantee you there's times you want to pray and you don't know how to pray, right? Amen. Like, I, I don't even know how to begin. Uh -huh. You know, that's when you're dishonest with him. I don't know how to begin. Amen. I want to feel you right now. I want to know you. I want you to help me with this situation. But I don't know. Amen. That's what Paul's talking about. He says, most of the time, I, Paul himself saying, most of the time, I don't know. And he has to rely on the Spirit, the same Spirit that we have to rely on today. Now, you know, I think, when I think about these things that we're reading here, think about this. The Apostle Paul, I said a while ago, handpicked by Messiah. All the works we know he did, all the evangelizing, the traveling around, and all the stuff he did. I find comfort in the fact that Paul feels the same way we do all the time. I don't know. You know, Paul's saying that. He's saying, I don't know. I have to rely on the Spirit because if I don't, I'm going to do wrong. I'm going to do evil because if I rely on my own self, I'm in trouble. Amen. Now he goes and he says, We know that all things work together for good for those who love God who are called according to His purpose. Amen. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. Hallelujah. So we're all supposed to be one large family. Amen. And it does say the word predestined there, but what does it mean? Okay. Some people some people take that scripture to say that we didn't have no choice. It's not true. He gives us all a choice. Amen. He predestined us based upon what? His pre-knowledge. Because he knows the end from the beginning. Mm -hmm. On the day of creation, he knew exactly who would choose him and who would not that would be born of this earth. Amen. From the first man to the last man. Think about that. That's how powerful he is. Amen. You know, he knew, and I had always, it always just, my mind can't really fully grasp the concept that on the day <coughs> of creation, he knew every one of us would be right here today. He knew the thought that would be in everybody's mind right here, right now, today. In fact, he knew the thought that would be in the mind of everybody around the world right now, today. That's amazing, isn't it? Yes, it is. I mean, and people are still trying to wrap this Creator up into their own human way of thinking. That's right. He's too big for that. He tells us that his ways are higher than ours, his mysteries baffle the wise. I mean, we cannot, if, he, if you could totally understand him, if you could put him into a ball of your own understanding and your own control, that's really what men want to do, then would he really be the most high? He'd be no different, right? Because we don't, we, to this day, listen, we know he exists, we know he's our savior, we know he's our everything, he's our creator. Can we 100% understand all about him? Absolutely not. There's no way. Your human mind is not capable of it. He's too big for that. But I know he's the one my faith is in. Come on. Yeah. He is the one who will come. He is the one who has already came because he says, he tells us that in the book of Revelation. And he's coming back for us. Now, 
He says in verse 30, And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And to whom he justified, he also glorified. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What then are we to say about these things? If God is with us, who is against us? Hallelujah. I remember a young man that said that way back in the Old Testament. Don't you? What was that guy's name? Somebody tell me his name. Joshua. Joshua. He said, we can take that land. He can take it because if he's with us, who can stand against us? Him and one other man. Think about that. Y'all remember the story of them leaving Egypt? Ah, uh, you had one time I could have told you a closer count, but it was millions and millions and millions of people. Out of all of those people, how many said we can take it? Two. Two. Two, two people grasp what? Paul's saying right here. It's how important it is for us to grasp this today. That if he's with us, who can stand against us? That's right. Because out of all, all those million, only two people grasp that. Two. Yep. And they weren't the old men in the group. Uh -uh. Everybody says all oh, the gray-haired people got wisdom. There were probably a lot of gray-haired people in that group. I doubt these two guys were gray-haired. They were fairly young. I think if you do the math, one of them was 30 and one of them was 40, actually. But, you know, they were called young men. And they were the only two that said, we can take it. They were the only two that had that faith, that knew that if he was with us, nobody could stand against us. Amen. And guess what? Out of all those millions that left there, how many of them entered into the promised land? Two. Two. Those two that show action with their faith. Those two were the all in ones. Did Moses enter into the promised land? No. Nope. Did Aaron enter into the promised land? Nope. Joshua and Caleb entered into the promised land. And you know, when you read in the book of Joshua, it says that whole generation that Joshua led remained faithful, remained faithful unto their death. Think about that. I was just reading this morning in the book of Joshua and that hit me. I was like, look at that. That whole generation, not <laughs> even after the death of Joshua, that whole generation that he led remained faithful. So that whole generation that was of accountability, mm -hmm. that were above 20, when that happened, they passed away in the desert. That's right. But those that were 20 and under that were led by two men of faith, that whole generation remain faithful. So don't ever think that your faith and you walk in your faith don't mean something to those watching you. Right. Because those young people were watching Joshua. They were watching Caleb. And they remained faithful their whole life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we think we concentrate oftentimes on that generation that didn't make it into the promised land. What about that generation that did? They made it in because why? They were, they were led by two men of faith and they were faithful. Amen. So they were faithful. Hallelujah. Amen. So oftentimes when we look at our ancestors and we look at the things around us, we get a little too caught up in that. We get a little caught up in who's not going to make it, right? We get a little caught up in who sent it. Guess what? We need to be looking at those of faith. We need to be looking at the Joshua and the Caleb's. We need to be following the example of those men, those women, those children. Amen. Those that are truly walking in faith, that's where our concentration needs to be. Because that whole generation made it. Hallelujah. Amen. They made it. And I mean, that's a, uh, that should tell us what we can do. What can you do by walking in faith? You can lead a whole generation. Think about that. This is what we have come up woefully lacking in, guys. Mm -hmm. Yeshua said, and we're going to get back to what Paul said here in a minute. Yeshua said, you can do greater works than I did. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about when he walked here on the earth. Any one of us in here should be able to be a Joshua and lead a whole generation into faith. 
Think about that. Think about that. It gives us some responsibility, right? But, but in order to fulfill that responsibility, what do you have to do? You have to claim that power from on high that he's offering. How do you do that? By accepting the indwelling of his spirit because Paul's already said you can't do nothing of yourselves. You can't do a thing of yourself. Paul also told us in Philippians chapter 4 what he tells us. What did Paul say there? Mm -hmm. He can do all things, right? Through Messiah who strengthened him. All things. So, just remember that. <clears throat> And let's see, what chapter, uh, verse are we in, guys? Anybody keeping up? 32. Okay. Yeah, 32. He did not, he who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not, not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Yeshua Messiah who died, yes, who was raised and is at the right hand of God, who intercedes for us. Hallelujah. Yeah. Now remember I told y'all there was going to be a verse that told us who that was that was interceding for us? Y'all remember back in verse 27 it said that the Spirit's the one that intercedes for us? Uh -huh. Right there it tells us that who is it that's interceding for us? It's Yeshua Messiah, the one that died for us. He is the one interceding for us. That's why Paul so many times throughout his writings calls the Spirit, Messiah Yeshua, dwelling bodily within you. So that Spirit is literally Messiah dwelling within you. That is Christ Himself. Amen. That is Yeshua Messiah, Jesus the Christ, whichever you prefer to call Him, dwelling bodily within you. That's right. So the one that came and died for you today still comes to you, dwells bodily in you, and enables you to do exactly what He did when He was here. Amen. That's why he can do it because he's already proven Satan a liar. And scripture explicitly says, You resist the devil and he'll do what? Flee. Flee from you. So if you've got the spirit of Messiah who's already resisted him, already conquered him, overcame death and hell, and all of those things, if he's dwelling within you, Satan has to flee Amen. from you. Amen. That's why you're no longer hostile to his law. That's why you can submit to it because Satan's got to flee. That's right. He can't hang around you That's right. because you're one of God's own elect. Amen. Special, predestined, right. ordained, and glorified. Right. Just where? Just where you can walk in his statutes, ordinance, and commands. Amen. And you can be holy as he was holy. Yeah. You're not doing it. He's doing it for you. That's but right. you allowed him to. Yeah. Because you humbled your heart to him. You said, I choose you. Yeah. You chose yeah. me. Now I choose you. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's how a marriage yeah. works, is it not? Yeah. That's, yeah. Why it's, that's why it's a marriage covenant with him. Yeah. One proposes and the other says yes, yes. I choose you Come on now. that's you. how it works Amen. that's how Satan will flee from you mm -hmm. because you've got the one that's already conquered him mm -hmm. within you Amen. much more powerful than anything of this world that's right. Mm -hmm. this world cannot touch you when you have that Amen. and you must get up each day and do what? accept that again yes. right. that's why the scripture says die daily, daily. Right. Yeah. Every day, accept that in your life. Yes. Every day. And guess what this world's got for you then? Nothing. Right. Amen. Guess what this world can hold against you then? Nothing. 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 Amen. And you won't be worried about this world. And you won't be worried about the one that's sinning. Other than to try to witness to them. Talking about you won't be worried about the one that's sinning against you. Is basically what I'm saying. Amen. Because... When we get too caught up in that, what is that? That's us slipping back into the flesh. Because guess what? People sinned against him constantly, right? When he walked yeah. the earth, they still sinned against him. When he walked the earth, people sinned against him constantly. Did he concentrate on that? Mm -hmm. Nope. He concentrated on the ones that were willing to listen. That's right. Amen. That's right. No matter who they appeared to be to the world, they were just some old raggedy fishermen. Mm -hmm. There was some crazy guy over here that was filled with demons. Mm -hmm. 
Those were the ones he concentrated on. You know why? Because it says he knew the hearts of all people. Amen. And he knew that within their heart, they were willing to follow him. That's right. They just needed a chance. Amen. They just needed him to propose where they could say, yes, Amen. I accept. Amen. I accept. So today, don't judge men by appearances. And don't worry about those that are sinning against you. Worry about those that might be wanting to turn from their sins. Amen. And they might need you to tell them about the one that redeems you. That's right. Amen. This one that Paul's talking That's about right. here. This one who's brought us out of darkness into light. This one who intercedes for us. Mm -hmm. He inter Think about that. He intercedes for us. And Paul says in the very next verse, Who will separate us from the love of Messiah? Will hardships, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are counted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced yes. that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Yeshua Messiah, our Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said, if you accept Him, it doesn't matter the hardship, death, perils, whatever comes, nothing can separate you from Him. Because He asked, who can separate us from Messiah? And His answer is, nobody or nothing. Amen. Nothing that's ever been or ever will come can separate us from Him. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. It doesn't matter. Yes. It doesn't matter what the world throws at you. Amen. If you are truly with Him, nothing can separate you from Him. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And it's a, you know you may suffer for a little moment, but just remember that's all it is—a little moment. Mm -hmm. What is a little moment compared to eternity? Mm -hmm. It is nothing. Mm -hmm. It should be counted as nothing. Amen. I mean, Hallelujah! Think about it. how long is eternity. Somebody asked me, how long is eternity? It's longer than that, right? <laughs> I mean, that's, there's no end to it. I mean, we truly can't grasp it, can we? I mean, it, because it's just like we know that he had no beginning, right? But we always in our mind will say, but where did he start? Right? It's, it's back to that human limitation again, right? We just have to trust in the spirit. He didn't have no beginning. He's always been. He don't have any ending. And guess what? We let him dwell within us and fight this battle for us. Amen. We don't have no ending. That's, right. That's, right. That's why he said his people have already passed from death unto life. Mm -hmm. We ain't got no ending. Right. Hallelujah. Amen. You think about that. We don't have an ending. Right. There does not have to be an end to your story. Amen. A story that never ends. Hallelujah. Think of that. Amen. That's, that's, what I, that's what I want. I don't, I don't want my story to ever end. I want my story to go on with him forever. Now, he goes on, and, and I'm going to read this a little bit in verse nine, uh, uh, chapter 9 here. He says, I am speaking the truth to the Messiah. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it by the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, all these things that I've just spoken to you, all of these things I received from the Holy Spirit. Because remember... He started off there at the end of chapter 7 telling us that he himself, he couldn't do anything good. Amen. And now he's just told you about all these good and wonderful, marvelous things. And now he's telling you, I received all this from the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. From that Holy Spirit that he accepted when he said yes. When he said, I accept you. I accept you dwelling within me. He received this message from me and you. Amen. He received this message to share with us. What a glorious message, right? Yes. He, he, you know, he goes on, he says, I have great sorrow and unceasing ac anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from the side for the sake of my own people, my kindred according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving to the laws, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from them according to the flesh, comes the Messiah who is overall God blessed forever. Amen. Amen. And he's saying, you, you, I, I read that part, I want you to, this is the way we have to feel. You know what Paul was saying? 
Paul was saying, if it would save this group of people, I would give up myself. If it would just save this group of people, I would give up myself. He tells us something else very important there too that some people deny today because he's talking about native-born Hebrews there and he said they need what? The adoption. Amen. I've heard it taught that, oh, well, Christ only had to come for the Gentiles. He didn't have to come for the Jews because he never divorced Judah. He divorced Israel. That ain't what he says right there. Amen. He says they all need the adoptions. Everyone has to accept Christ, be covered in his blood, or there is no hope. And he said, and Paul's saying, I am willing to give up all of mine if it would just save them. Mm. That's the love that Messiah had for us. That Paul grasped that new commandment because Messiah said, what about that new commandment? I give you a new commandment, and he had the authority to do it, right? That you love one another exactly as I have loved you. What he do? He laid down his life for us. Right. And that's what Paul grasped and Paul was saying, I would give mine right now if it would just save this group of people. Because what? He loved that group of people. Amen. Now, Scripture, we go back to the book of Acts, that very group of people he just spoke of, Paul had walked away from. Them. Paul had walked away from them and he said, I can no longer fellowship with you. I'm dusting my feet off and I'm out of here. That's what he told them. Didn't mean he didn't love them though. You don't hang around with everybody you love. That's a, that's a lesson that Paul's given us right there. Because, he, because like I say, back in Acts, I remember when he said, I'm done with you guys, I'm going to the Gentiles. Now he's talking about those very guys, and he's saying, I'd lay down my life for them today if it just happened. So it don't mean you quit loving because you walk away. Right. But you have to walk away sometimes because... What fellowship does light have with dark? That's the Apostle right. Paul asked that question also. He asked that question in the Corinthians. And he also tells us in the Corinthians to what? Not be unequally yoked. Yeah. Everybody relates that to marriage, and it does. It does relate to marriage. But it also relates to this marriage, this body. Yeah. You know, we're all married to Messiah. That marriage counts too. Amen. Someone else that's not married to Messiah the way you're supposed to be married to Messiah to Christ is not who you're supposed to be hanging around with. Don't mean you're never around them. You gotta be around them to witness to them. Being around someone and hanging around with someone's two different things. Mm -hmm. Don't be unequally yoked with this world. Because if you become unequally yoked with this world, you are destined to slide back into this world. It's a fact. Why the Bible talks about the backslidden. If there wasn't no such danger, it wouldn't be mentioned. That's right. It would not be mentioned. Now, we're talking about what Paul taught. I'm not going to go to all of these scriptures, but I'm going to give y'all a list of scriptures that where Paul talks about the law being good and holy, and do we do away with the law by faith? Trust me, it's a bunch of good scriptures to do with what Paul had to say about the law. I'm going to give you a list of them for the people who are taking notes. Many of them are right here in the book of Romans. Romans 2 and 12. Romans 3 and 31. Romans 7 and 7. Romans 6, 1, and 1 through 2. Romans 7 and 12. Ephesians 5 and 8. Ephesians 6 and 14, Philippians 1, 9 through 11, 2 Timothy 2 and 22, and very importantly, 2 Timothy 3 and 16, it doesn't specifically mention the law, but did anybody tell me what 2 Timothy 3 and 16 says? I know somebody here knows that scripture. All Scripture is God breathed. Good for doctrine, good for correction, good for reproof, good for righteousness. All Scripture. So, that's always one when we start thinking about what Paul taught, because that's a little bit of what I, what I want to talk about today. And we're going to close out here in a second. But that's what I wanted to talk about. What Paul taught, because so many people say Paul taught this, Paul taught that. 
Today we've read directly from the words of Paul. What Paul teaches today. You gotta have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, whichever you prefer to call it. Without it, you're powerless. With it, nothing can touch you because you've got Christ dwelling bodily within you that's already conquered Satan. So now you've got to flee from you. Amen. And nothing can separate you from him. Hardships, death, none of those things if you discontinue to walk with him. Amen. There's only one thing in this world that can separate you from Messiah, and that's you. Amen. Because he's not a dictator. Some people make him out to be, but he's not. He's a loving creator. Amen. He desires that you walk with him. He won't force you to. That's right. You yourself is the only thing, because he says no one can pluck me can pluck you out of my hand. Amen. No one can. The adversary can't take you away from him. You're the only one that can step away from him. You yourself have that choice. Don't ever make that choice. Amen. Each day when you get up, choose to walk with him, with his Holy Spirit within you, and there's nothing in this world that can touch you. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. You will be able to conquer all and come through all. And if we claim the power like he said, we should be doing the same works that he did. Amen. Walk exactly like he walked. He said, do greater works than I. Be a Joshua. Lead a whole generation. Amen. Lead a whole generation. Think about that. We can lead a whole generation, y'all. And we somebody's got to. There's 144,000 that have to be led by somebody, have to be brought up by somebody. Why not us? Amen. Why not us? Amen. 